There's a story in the canon where a monk is sitting in a little hut out in the forest, and his meditation isn't going very well. And off in the distance he hears the sound of music. The village is having a festival. People are dancing and singing, playing instruments. And he gets depressed. Here he is, alone, having no fun at all. And he starts envying the villagers. They at least know how to have a good time. And a deva comes and appears to the monk and he says, Do you realize how many people who have been dancing and singing are now going to hell? They really envy you. Where you are is on the pathway that goes up. Their pathway goes down. The point here, of course, is that the practice is not always enjoyable, and there are a lot of things you have to give up, but it is a trade. And it's up to each of us to decide exactly how much we want to trade. Remembering that our choices do have consequences. Most people would like to believe that every path out there all goes up to the top of the mountain. which bears no resemblance to actual geography at all. There are a few paths that reach the top of the mountain, and there are a lot that just kind of wander around through the, the lowlands, go up a bit and then go down. Some of them lead down into the ocean, some lead down into Death Valley, and you get stuck. So it's not a matter of going into the store and just choosing which path you want, guaranteed that every one is going to take you where you want to go. This is part of the Buddha's knowledge, realizing that different paths go in different places. There is the path to the end of suffering. There's also a path to heaven. There's a path to the rebirth as a human being. The path leading to rebirth as a dog or another common animal, and then down to the lower realms. And some of the paths start out enjoyable and they go bad, and others start out bad and they go to a good place, and others start out good and go to a good place. So you can't take your likes and dislikes, or your preference for an easy path, as any real guide. So you have to decide where you want to go. What do you want to do with your life? Or think about the end of your life. What kind of life would you like to look back on? What kind of choices would you like to look back on? And be willing to make a trade. The case is where the Buddha says there are times when you're practicing the holy life and tears are running down your face out of frustration, out of discouragement. He says even then it's best to stick with the path. Because this path at least is a way out. The other paths you might take all lead back in, come back again and again and again. Of course, it's not the case that the path is always going to be difficult. But the Buddha does note that for some people the path is going to be easy and quick, and for others it's going to be easy and slow. For others it's going to be painful and quick, and still others are going to be painful and slow. And again, if we could choose the one we wanted, we might say, well, I'll be willing to go for pleasant and easy and long, maybe. I might have a good time along it, or I might decide I want to take the short one. But we all want the pleasant path. But that's not something you can choose. You have to look at the kind of mind you have and what it responds to. And if it turns out that you have to follow the difficult path, well, that's, your, that's the situation you're stuck with. And again, it's your choice. If you decide you don't want to follow the path because it's difficult, well, think of the path that you would be following then, 
there may be some easy things, but paths go on and on and on. I was talking to someone who was complaining about how long the path seemed. The path to awakening. I said, well, think about how the path to not awakening, how long that one is. It doesn't really end. It just goes on and on and on and again and again and again. So the path to awakening always is shorter and involves a lot less suffering. The Buddha once picked up a little pinch of dirt and said, which is more, the, the dirt in the great earth or the dirt that I have in my, my fingers here? Of course it was the dirt in the great earth that's much larger. And he said in the same way, when someone who has gained stream entry, the amount of suffering left to them is like that little pinch of dirt. For someone who hasn't, it's like the entire earth. And so the path to not awakening is not the pleasant path, it seems, or the easy path, or the short path. The path to awakening is always the shorter path and always the one that involves less suffering. It's that passage where the Buddha says, if you could make a deal that they're going to spear you with a hundred spears in the morning, a hundred spears at noon, and a hundred spears in the evening every day for a hundred years. But you'd be guaranteed enlightenment at the end, guaranteed awakening at the end. He said it'd be a good deal. And when you finally did attain awakening, you wouldn't think that you had attained it with pain and suffering. The joy, the total happiness that comes from awakening is so great that it would blot out a hundred years of 300 spears a day. So it helps to keep things in perspective when you're thinking about how difficult the path may be and how uncertain it may be, that even when it goes through difficulties, it's still a bright path. And it's not that this is the only life you would choose where you have to make a trade. Every life is a trade. Some people trade wealth. Take the trade that leads to wealth, but they have to sacrifice all kinds of other things that are really of genuine value. Often people don't think about it, but they are making a trade. There are lots of things that they're selling off at fire sale rates. Goodwill, compassion, these get sold off. Discernment, patience, persistence. Mindfulness, concentration, discernment, all the good qualities of the mind get sold off in most people's lives. So it's a question of making an intelligent trade. We see the pleasures that other people are enjoying and we, we can't see their pain. Which is why when looking at other people's lives, sometimes we think, well, that looks like an easy life, that looks like a nice life. Think of that story of the king who became a monk and sat under the tree, exclaiming, what bliss, what bliss, and the other monks were concerned. They thought that he was reflecting on how happy he had been as a king and was missing his kingly pleasures. So they informed the Buddha. And the Buddha called the monk into his presence and asked him, well, why is it you're sitting under the tree saying, what bliss, what bliss, what do you have in mind? And the monk said, well, I think back to when I was a king and at night I would go to bed and even though I had guards posted in the palace and outside the palace, in the city, outside the city, in the countryside, even outside the frontiers, I was still afraid for fear that someone would come and either try to take everything I had or kill me, or both. But now I sit under a tree with my one satisfied, and I see no danger from any quarter at all, any direction at all. My mind, as he said, is like a wild deer, totally free. That's why I say, what bliss, what bliss. 
Well, the king had to make a trade. If he was going to keep his power and keep his wealth and keep all of his pleasures, he was going to have to put up with all that fear. So he traded it for things that nobody else wanted. When you have things that no one else wants, you don't have any danger. This is one of the advantages of living in a monastery that, where we don't have beautiful buildings. People come and nobody, are, nobody I've seen is jealous. And John Lee talks about this, wearing thrown-off rags, making robes out of thrown-off rags. And you have to think back in the time of the Buddha, they would actually take those thrown-off rags, sometimes off of corpses, wash them, boil them, make their robes out of that. This is that kind of clothing has no dangers at all, because nobody else wants it. So learn to look at the advantages of living a life of renunciation. You have, you're living with things that nobody else is jealous of, and you gain wealth that nobody else can steal. All well, the treasures of conviction, virtue, sense of shame and compunction, your knowledge of the Dharma, generosity and discernment, the food of good concentration. Nobody else can take these things away from you. These are treasures that are safe. If you take treasures that are out there in the world, one of the images that John Lee used to, likes to use a lot is of gold chains that people wear around their necks. It's very common in Thailand. So you have a gold chain around your neck, people will try to steal it. You can, they'll hurt your neck as they pull it off. That's a good image for all the wealth in the world. If you have status, people are going to be jealous of your status. When you get praised, people are going to be jealous of you because you're praised. And those things are not really yours anyhow. People can come and just take them away. After all, they're the ones who give you the wealth. They're the ones who give you the status, the praise. They can tr change their minds at any point. But if you have the wealth that you can develop within, as John Lee says, one, it's safe because nobody else knows it. They can't see it. John Mahabua comments that this is one of the drawbacks of the Dharma in the sense that if people could see the, the treasures of a noble one's mind, everybody would want it. But you can't take it out and show it to people. But it's also an advantage. You've got something that nobody else can see, but really gives true happiness. It's safe. There are things you have to give up in order to gain that. But everything in the world is a trade. There's a risk in every choice. So you look at the odds. As the Buddha said, you live assuming that your actions do have consequences. And you live by that assumption. You don't lose. Even if it turns out your actions have no consequences, it's all illusory. At least you're living in a mind with good intentions. There's a sense of honor that goes with that. That's why he calls that assumption a safe bet. Of course, there's also the risk of the path may be long. It may not be easy as you like, but as easy as you like it to be. But remember, the path to awakening is always much shorter than the path to non-awakening. And the sense of true, unchanging happiness that comes as a result blots out any difficulty on the path.
So the choice is yours, what kind of trade you want to make, because we're always making trades and we're always gambling with every choice we make. So make your trades and place your bets as wisely as you can. <laughs>